Hello everybody and welcome to Dot to Dot. Today we're going to talk about the translator of the 90 foot stone, the actual person who may have translated the cipher code on the 90 foot stone. Before I do that though, we're going to tell you about the Quest of Oak Island podcast, Saturday, July 9th at 5 p.m. Eastern. Olivier and myself will be on that podcast. Uh, I hope you can join us. We'll be talking about uh, Season 9 and whatever else comes up. I will leave a link in the uh, description to the Quest of Oak Island YouTube channel. You can uh, subscribe and push the notification button so you don't miss it. So let's get with this and we're going to talk about the translator. Now when we talk about the translation of the 90 foot stone, the first person who comes to mind is Reverend Austin T. Kempton. And he's the one that brought forth to the public actually, it wasn't actually him, it was another author named Ed Rowe who actually brought forth the cipher solution and the message 40 feet below 2 million pounds are buried. Now in my last video I talk about the 90 foot stone and I bring forth the new perspective that there was actually two stones and that one was kept at Creighton's bookstore with the initials JM which was stood for Jotham Macaulay who uh, was basically the foreman and treasurer for the Oak Island excavations from uh, in the mid 1800s and they were the last excavations that were actually done by local people that actually were connected to the original uh, finders McGinnis, Smith and Vaughn. But A.T. Kempton was a, a reverend, a Baptist reverend and he brought forth the information and it is said that he received that information from an old Irish school teacher uh, and that was connected to Mahone Bay and that the uh, the Irish school teacher had died uh, prior to him actually going and talking to him but he was able to receive this in 1909 and in 1909 uh, Reverend Kempton actually lived in Ludenburg so it's quite a mystery but we're gonna look into that right now so the person that is supposedly to translated the 90-foot stone was James Lecty and his connection to uh, the 90-foot stone I would say pretty much came through James DeMille and he was an author he was also a professor that arrived at Dalhousie College where James Lecty worked at the same year in 1865 and he was a professor of history and rhetoric um, he did not live uh, very long he died at age 46 uh, in 1880 so in his book, in James DeMille's book, which is actually a fictional book, uh, he does not mention anything about the translation. So it's sort of uh, surmised that, that the translation did not develop before 1880. And uh, Lecti, he w first arrived in uh, or the first record of him being in Nova Scotia was when he became a grammar school and he was a, a grammar school teacher for six years and then he taught uh, modern he was a tutor of modern languages at Dalhousie College in 1865 so we know he was there at least uh, there uh, 1859 would be the latest date that he would have been there. Uh, he eventually becomes the uh, the professor of the modern languages department, and he retired in 1906. 
And so this fits the bill that uh, the translation came from an re old retired school teacher in 1909 because he would have been retired. And he, they, he also died in Ludenburg. He died in Ludenburg. So he lived in Ludenburg at least till uh, 1925. And we're going to look at some other things in just a moment of tracing his life. So one of the things about James DeMille that's not mentioned by a lot of uh, researchers is that, first of all, he's one of the first people to give a description that is different from the Creighton Bookstore Stone, which is a hard granite stone uh, with not smooth round edges. DeMille gives a description that, that this is a hewn stone so it's been cut, and that it's a kind of a set sandstone. And in my previous video, I note that the two descriptions, one is, one stone is granite, hard, hard granite, which is uh, really hard to cut, and it's also really hard to wear off anything that's been cut into it. And then the other one, the other descriptions are like this, a sandstone or a flagstone is the next description. The other thing that's not mentioned by other researchers is, is that in this book, even though it is fictional, he, set, he states in it, I've seen it dozens of times. So I believe that the people that uh, they say were in Halifax, that they took the stone too, were James DeMille, for one, and through him, uh, James Lecty get, gets involved. There's not too many professors at Dalhousie College at this time, maybe 10. I'm not for sure, but there's not very many. It's not a very big college, so they definitely would be in contact with one another. Uh, one of the latest accounts, and this is in The Curse of Oak Island by Ran Randall Sullivan, he puts forth this, and talking about the inscription of the 90-foot stone, he says, that inscription might have surfaced in the early 20th century when James Lecty, a professor of languages at what was then Dalhousie College, wrote... Notice he says wrote. Now, I couldn't find in my research any letters or any kind of correspondence of any kind uh, that was written by James Lecty. So I challenge this a little bit because um, even though he's probably a better researcher than I and he probably has a lot more contacts to get better research uh, information, um, he puts in his book that James Lecty wrote that he had seen the inscribed stone and decoded the message, which read, according to the professor, 10 feet below, 2 million pounds lie buried. So this is what uh, Sullivan, Randall Sullivan, is saying. And I don't know, I challenge it because he further goes on to basically say that Lecty uh, was employed by the treasure company um, to help sell stocks. And of course, we're going back on to that. The main critical uh, dispute against the 90-foot stone being fake and made up is that it was used to sell stocks to the company. But I'm finding over and over again that this stone was very much downplayed, that the uh, even the inscriptions later on by a man named Frederick Blair were very much uh, criticized. They weren't so much, uh, the stone wasn't criticized, but there was a very much a doubt about the uh, translation. So the 90-foot stone is something that nobody has a record of the inscription. So it is... That is one of the main reasons why that this uh, is contested, that this translation is contested, because there's no evidence of the inscription that we know of, except for 
that which is put forth by A.T. Kempton. And they say, critics will say that this is made up, that the, in, that the information by A.T. Kempton was made up. And that's where the inscription changes when it is given to Edward Snow in The True Tales of Buried Treasure. And also it is where we find out that this information comes from an old Irish schoolmaster. So this is through A.T. Kempton. But I find it interesting that he writes in his book that actual that Lecti actually wrote that he decoded the message. So that can go either way. So these are the different translations of the stone. The first, and this is in chronological order, the first translation was 10 feet below, 2 million pounds are buried. And then there was a book in 1911 where it says 10 feet below, 2 million pounds lie buried. So there's a difference, a little bit of a difference here. But I believe that uh, the 1911 account comes directly from the Oak Island story. And I'm going to show you the actual Oak Island story in just a minute. And then we have the last one, which is the translation that we know today, 40 feet below, 2 million pounds are buried, coming from Austin uh, Kempton. And it is published in the book by Ed Snow in 1951. So this is uh, James Lechte, and this is from the Almanac at Dalhousie College. He was born in 1835, and he died in 1925. So one of the things I've pulled up is his uh, death record, and one of the main uh, objections to Lechte being the translator is that he's not Irish, that on his death certificate here it says he is Swiss born now I find that interesting it says Swiss born in other words it's like I didn't come from Switzerland but I was born there that's what I sort of see here um, he was pretty old he was 89 years old here it says he's the professor of languages the length of residence this here is 10 years and I don't believe this is the length of residence that he was in Canada, obviously, because he was at Dalhousie College for, what, 35, 40 years? But uh, he died in Ludenburg, so he was in Ludenburg. Again, we got Swiss here. He makes a lot of references. Yeah, I'm from Switzerland. Like, he's almost like saying, I'm from Switzerland. I'm not Irish. But we're going to go, let's see. This is his uh, daughter. This is his daughter's death certificate. I could only find that he only had one child who was a daughter. It's sort of sad. It seems like she was single her whole life. Uh, she lived in Ludenburg and died in Ludenburg. Uh, however, she, her birthplace was Ludenburg County. So we can sort of surmise here that, that uh, James Lechte lived in Ludenburg County in 1867, which is only two years after he arrived at Dalhousie College. And if you look at this, here's Ludenburg, here's Mahone Bay. This is the town of Mahone Bay, who the supposed teacher, where the supposed teacher lived, who gave the information to Reverend Kempton. And it's not very far, and it is in Ludenburg County. So it is very, very possible and likely that James Lechte lived in Mahone Bay, the town of Mahone Bay. And here's Oak Island up here. When I got onto a research, uh, genealogy research, I put in James Lechte, I put in Ireland. And I got two hits for James Lechte. One will give us some information I'll show you in a minute. And the other one gives us a little bit more information. But I put in Switzerland. I put in England. I put in France. And there's Lechtes all over that. But uh, this is the only country that came up with 
James Lecti. Uh, Switzerland did not come up with his name and notice the dates 1850 to 1900 match exactly because he came here probably somewhere in the mid 1800 1850s and notice it says Dublin Ireland so even though he's Swiss born he may have lived in Ireland for some time I know a lot of Swiss People migrated from Switzerland in the mid-1700s due to textile industry disruptions from England, allowing France to send more textiles. It was sort of a sanction against France, and they lifted it. And a lot of them migrated to uh, Holland, England, France, and uh, Ireland. So... When I click on the first James Lecty uh, in the genealogy, I get this reference, which is to the Almanac directory, talking about a professor of modern languages, James Lecty, M.A. So that is our man. Uh, the next, when I clicked on the other uh, James Lecty, I got this article here. It's from Iowa. And it's talking about pensions given out to college professors through the Carnegie Foundation and James Lecty at Dalhousie University. So both of these, uh, both of these right here, both of them uh, connect to Dalhousie College. It has references to that. So. It is very likely that James Lecty came from Ireland. Another thing about James Lecty, being a professor of modern languages, he would have had the skills to analyze written and visual sources. So even though he wasn't a person who was into um, perhaps deciphering uh, coded messages or anything like that he may have had the skills to decode the 90 foot stone i mean it really wasn't that big of a, a cipher it was simple substitution uh, letter for symbol so it wasn't something that really was difficult to decipher and i believe he had the ability to decipher it so that is James Lecty. Now we're going to get into Fred Blair. And Frederick Blair was uh, the person who spent a lot of time on Oak Island. And a lot of critics say that Frederick Blair and Reverend Kempton were in cahoots together to basically sell shares. And that the whole thing about the 90-foot stone and the inscription was made up. And... Blair, uh, you're gonna. We're gonna show. You, I'm gonna show you that he really didn't. He believed that the 90 foot stone existed. He. I don't think he ever saw it. He didn't know where it was. If he did, he kept it. He said he didn't, and he was keeping it secret. But I don't think he ever saw it. And he was very skeptical about the translation that Lecti uh, gave forth, and. He was part of the Oak Island Treasure Company. And here's two old school guys that we have mentioned before, Tupper and McDonald. Now, I don't know if this is the McDonald that uh, actually was one of the people that testified in seeing the 90-foot stone and the cipher. But uh, he, McDonald was one of the people on his uh, Oak Island Treasure Company. So he was... He had some old school people that were working with him. And here's an affidavit uh, stating that he knew and conversed and had interviews and knew Tupper and Jefferson McDonald and the lady that fell into the uh, cave-in pit with her mule and also the descendants of uh, Daniel McGinnis John and Arthur McGinnis, and also Anthony Vaughn, George Vaughn, uh, descendants of the original Money Pit people. He 
was in contact with. So he was somewhat well connected. I want to note here, though, that notice that Jotham McCulley is not listed here. So, and I believe Jotham McCulley was the person who was keeping the 90 foot stone. This is a letter to uh, Thomas Nixon in 1933. And this is just showing that, you know, uh, Frederick Blair, uh, he, he didn't really know where the stone was. And, you know, he pretty much thought that uh, it was lost due to, due to neglect. And uh, so it just goes to show you, he didn't really have much uh, faith in uh, what was, you know, cut into the stone. Uh, he, and I'll show you that, that he really... Uh, didn't understand why it was gone only that it was from neglect and here he is you know he uh, Frederick Blair he was the leaseholder of the Oak Island uh, money pit area from 1900 to 1940 and this is a guy that Thomas Nixon actually went on Oak Island for a year looking for the treasure and this is a letter basically telling him Hey, I don't know where the stone is, and it's not a big selling point. That's what I guess I'm trying to say. This is the Oak Island, the story of Oak Island. This is what I believe is probably people say the prospectus of Oak Island, but it's actually a pamphlet. And this record is basically uh, written up by the Oak Island Treasure Company. And this is what it says about the 90-foot stone. And this is one of the first publications that actually state that it's 3 feet long, 16 inches wide, and that it was a flat stone. And here is the first, uh, the first translation documentation of what it said. It says, one expert gave his reading of the inscription as follows 10 feet below are 2 million pounds buried and uh, we give this statement for what it's worth but by no means claim that it is correct interpretation apart from this however the fact remains that the history and the description of the stone as given above have never been disputed so basically he's saying you know we're not sure about this translation, uh, but the stone definitely existed. And he's going by pretty much the testimony of the people he knew. Further, he states in this that he basically gives the story about the 90-foot stone uh, that has been used in the book binders to beat leather on until... Every trace of the mark had been worn away. And he also says, these marks have been described to me. So somebody gave him a description. And he says, I cannot see in them any warrant for the remarkable interpretation given by the expert. Notice how it's in quotes. The stone can be seen at the tourist at Creighton store in Halifax. So I don't understand why everybody thinks that the Blair was using this stone to attract uh, investors. And this is in a long, you know, this is a book, The Story of Oak Island. This is just a couple of sentences that he talks about the stone. So it definitely wasn't something that was used to try and sell people shares. If anything, it was detracting from that objective. This is the second account, and this is in a book called The, Bar the Book of Buried Treasure by Ralph DePayne. And it is, uh, he was a member of Skull and Bones in Yale. He is a very prolific writer. He wrote many, many, many books, and he is also a politician in New Hampshire. I used to live in New Hampshire. And uh, basically he he gets the translation 
a little bit different, but I think he pretty much gets this from the Oak Island story in 1895, and he puts it in his book. And of course, he puts, you know, that this 90 foot stone, that the inscription had been worn away. Now, remember, this is a piece of hard, probably the hardest granite you can get, and it's being worn away. It's not likely. And that's what uh, Colonel Bodine said uh, in 1909. He didn't believe that the inscription was ever on the stone because it's too hard. Uh, this is just a actual page of the book showing uh, the two, uh, the 10 feet below, 2 million pounds I buried. This is Payne's book. So we get into Reverend Kempton, and I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to make another video about Reverend Kempton, and we'll get into uh, how he brings forth his information. And you're going to find that, you know, he was very much a person who was interested in the history of Acadia. He was very much interested in uh, the story of Oak Island. He grew up in Nova Scotia. He actually grew up in uh, Kings County, which is the county just west of uh, Ludenburg County. And there's actually a lake named after his family, Kempton Lake. And his family was very uh, prominent within uh, Kings County and Nova Scotia. And he probably was very well known in uh, Lunenburg. And he lived there uh, for a number of years. But we'll get into him next time. And I'm going to make this video and probably uh, upload them the same day. But I'm going to give you a break right here. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe. And if you cared to donate to this channel, push the thanks button. All right. I'll talk to you next time. Thank you very much. Bye.